So thank you so much for being here. Um, we came from Austria, as you might hear eventually, and we're super excited to bring our knowledge to you guys. Today we want to talk about tackling audience experiences in games. So not looking at games from the typical player's point of view, but there are also other people who might be interested in the game. Um, but first things first, um, let me quickly introduce ourselves. So my name is Johanna Birka. And my name is Rainer Angemann. I'm a researcher and I'm a lecturer at the Graz University of Technology in Austria. So I'm coming from the academic side. And I'm CEO and co-founder of the Austrian-based indie studio Rearbyte. So my background, I have a PhD in computer science. I love doing research. I love doing data analysis, like machine learning. I love looking at the player's point of view through this data analysis. I also do AI research. So everything very academic versus very researchy. Well, I'm not a doctor, but I've been working a lot in uh, games and our company has published about 25 titles on all the major platforms. So we're into creating, developing and publishing games. Um, all I can publish is papers as an academic, um, which is also lovely because I can gather knowledge and bring it to the people by publishing those papers. And to publish those papers, I obviously need data. Um, but again, when I do not develop games or publish games, I don't have often access to this data. So, Yeah, luckily our games produce a lot of data that can be used for analyzing them. So found that being a researcher at the research institution and working together with an indie game studio is a very, very good benefit for both of us because I can use this data um, to help their studio to improve the games. On the other hand, I can also use this data to publish interesting contributions um, for the community. So we found this is something which we have in common, but there's also something else we do have in common. We both love streaming. So I love streaming games. I'm a streamer myself. I'm not a good streamer or a popular streamer, but I enjoy it myself. Um, and what I found most interesting actually was looking at the chat while streaming. Because looking at the chat, there's something going on which is so different compared to what we have when designing games. So there's the entire population of spectators and we wanted to find out more about those big data through data analysis. Yeah, well, I've also gained a lot of uh, experience in streaming. It's more about streaming development and playtesting of our games. So, um, yeah, today we um, want to talk about this spectator. Who is a spectator and how can we design to engage spectators? And uh, last but not least, we want to uh, give away some evaluation strategies that we use together in this field. So we will give this talk a little bit from the researcher's perspective and then also from the designer developer's perspective. Um, so when we think about a spectator, we need to first find a proper definition for a spectator. A spectator can be found in so many different and several places. A spectator can be someone watching a stream without any action, just being there and watching a streamer. But it can be also someone who is really involved and really engaged, constantly in interacting with the streamer and with other spectators through the chat, for example, asking questions, making comments. It can be also someone who is just sitting at home, maybe a parent watching over the shoulder of the child playing a video game, maybe being invested, maybe not at all. But it could be also a fan in a stadium filled with thousands of fans enjoying together um, a StarCraft play. So spectators can be found in so many several places and we also need to consider the different types of spectators with different backgrounds. For this talk, we want to use a definition of spectators, that spectators are basically people who follow the gameplay in real time without being the main player in, um, of the game. Eventually, they have impact on the game to some extent, which we'll hear here later, but it's not the main focus. Yeah, but first, let us take a step back and see what um, is important for the player. So the player wants to have a good playing and uh, streaming experience. Um, and a player wants interaction possibilities with the viewers that are there in the chat or um, viewing on site, for example. Uh, it's all about entertaining those viewers and retaining those viewers. And in the end, um, the goal is to build a community around the game, the player and the stream, for example. 
When you design a video game for a spectator, however, you need to think of different aspects. Because as soon as a player would enter a stream, the spectator must immediately know what's going on, understand the gameplay mechanics and so on. You should think of different interaction possibilities with either the player or with the, with the other viewers. They want to be entertained, surprised, so they have different motives for coming to the stream. Or they just want to be part of the community as a social aspect. We also need to know that fans and spectators is something different. A fan can become to have, um, a, a spectator can become to a fan, but they don't start off as a fan immediately. So. Fans are usually motivated by a lot of achievements. However, data can be motivated by so many different things without the necessity that they are fans. They can just enjoy the aesthetics of the game, this drama or the skill of players. Um, there are different strategies which, we, which are definitely interesting for us as game designers, how to make viewers to fans, but that's probably a different talk. Today we want to focus on the motives for the spectators and what's interesting about that. So, spectators are motivated by different aspects of a, of a streaming or game watching experience. So, some are eventually more interested in the game itself. Some are eventually interested in the streamer or player or team, esports team, as a person or as a team. And others are interested in the social experiences and want to interact with other spectators or the community. So in literature, we can find different motives for spectating. Interestingly enough, there's not a lot of re research yet on streaming or in esports behavior. It's growing and becoming more important, but the most research we found, and which is very similar to what we are interested in, can be found in sports events. So going to a football game, to a soccer game, for example, um, and understanding the spectators' motives there can help us also understand the motives for people watching a stream or going to an esports match. So the, um, some of the motives can be, for example, the identification that a spectator really wants to be associated with a successful player and also wants to celebrate his success. The aesthetics, this is really, really important. They really enjoy the beauty of the game. Um, we have drama and excitement. This is this idea that you experience this thrill, maybe stress, but a ple very pleasant form of stress while watching a game. Um, escape. Escape would be that you escape from this daily routine and you come home from work and you just turn on a, scream, a stream and watch the stream just to getting relaxed again. Um, knowledge. Eventually, you're a gamer yourself and you want to learn more about the game. You want to experience through the skills of the um, player and you want to learn the social interactions, um, especially on Twitch. This is so important that you're able to communicate with other um, spectators, this affiliation to some sort of a community, to some sort of a group. And then the team or the player support, that you are part of a community who is supporting a player. Similar to player types, which all of you might know, there are also different types of spectators. This is one form, simple model we built, where you have the, um, the player and the game as main interest points for spectators, could be also other spectators. And some people really want to interact, some however want to consume. So those, for example, who want to interact with other players or with the players are socializers. Those who want to consume and learn from the skills from a player, for example, can be learners. Those who want to be part of the game, make some sort of impact on the game, can be participators. And those who are consuming the games, they're just enjoying the beauty. And based on that, in literature, we find um, nine different um, personas. And what we all know, when we create games, it's always important to think about those different personas who we are designing the games for. The same can be done for spectators. So there's, for example, the bystander. The bystander is someone who is still very, not very interested in the game yet, who just happens to be there, 
this one is either uninformed about the game or uninvested and not really engaged yet. However, this can change. If there's something happening which is engaging, for example, some drama or some excitement, the, this one can become to a curious one. The curious is suddenly interested in the game and then wants to learn more about the game. It starts with a small fascination and they eventually start watching and watching more. And this one eventually becomes to the inspired. The inspired feels like, oh, that's a cool game. I also want to play this game. This one would eventually, after the stream, go to Steam and buy the game him or herself. Um, this is already a very, very nice process when you got to Inspired. And as soon as you already know about the game, you eventually become the pupil. A pupil, this one wants to learn. This one wants to understand specific techniques, tricks of a player, or wants to learn about specific maps within the game. Um, he's or she is very interested in learning details. So this one would ask question, would, um, would interact with the player or would interact with other spectators. And then there's the unsatisfied, um, AKA the grumpy one, um, who would rather like to be playing him or herself, which comes from a desire. Uh, an example for that would be um, a dad playing with his son and the son wants to play and the dad has to watch, but actually wants to play himself. Um, Next, there's the entertained, and the entertained would rather prefer watching over playing. So there's this difference that that content is being watched for entertainment, um, basically like a movie. Then we have the assistant. The assistant wants to sort of impact the game um, progress. They want to help, they want to be a, some sort of advisor. They, this one would be, for example, the older brother, brother sitting next to me and trying to help me through the levels. But this could be also someone who wants to tell me about things which I don't want to know because I want to explore the game myself. Then there's the commentator. This is a very interesting one. This one is a spectator and a performer or entertainer at the same time. This one wants to entertain other spectators. This one would be constantly talking about the game, giving comments in the, in the chat, in the Twitch that also constantly talking about the game. Um, this can be also some sort of a cameraman telling a different perspective. Um, and last, the last one is a part of the crowd. This one wants to be part of the community. If something insane is happening and the, the, the crowd would go wild or in a stream, the, the entire chat will, will be flooded. This is what the, the part of the crowd would enjoy. Yeah, so now that we've learned about these different types of personas, of respect, uh, spectators, how can we design to engage the spectators? Well, first of all, um, our main goal as a game designer will be to create a playable game. But uh, speaking of spectators, we also want to create a watchable game. So that means viewers need to be able to understand what's going on in the game and they need to be able to keep track of everything that is going on in the game at any time. And also we want to retain those viewers, that means we want them to come back to our stream or to our play session, and they should keep watching. What we identified were uh, those three phases of spectator engagement. Uh, first, we want to attract people to a game or to a stream, and we want to teach them about the game. So what, the ge what is the game about? How is the game played? What are the rules of the game? Next, we want to retain those viewers so that they come back um, and maybe tell others and watch again, keep watching. And third, um, we want community involvement and engagement. Um, so that means um, we want people to interact with uh, streamers and with each other. And this is all to support the spectator's motives that we have heard before. So, uh, for example, we can attract with the aesthetics of a game or with drama or just with basic simplicity um, uh, so that people are, um, yeah, they know how the game works. And we can use drama for retaining viewers, for example, and we can try to build up knowledge so that people come back, learn something more. And then we have social interaction for involvement and engagement. We can um, encourage people um, to teach others about the game 
um, and we can uh, support this affiliation that uh, viewers will be um, supporting a specific team, for example, or a special player or, or stream. So uh, what happens when a viewer walks into a stream? First uh, question that pops up is, what is happening here? And as I said before, um, the optimum thing would be that the game is just very easy to pick up. And from the very first second, you actually know what, uh, what's going on. But we want to have viewers learn about the game while watching the game or the stream. So our goal is first to design to attract viewers. Um, and that, is, that, that should be seen in all the different kind of areas of the development of the game. Um, coming from game design, then graphics, UI, all those features, they should give spectators visual hints and experiences about all the actions that are currently happening in the game. People should know about the tactics and even emotions the players are going through. Um, a good example for, for that is in League of Legends, uh, there's a color scheme indicating what is happening at the time. So you just jump into stream and then you see a certain color and you know, okay, this is the current phase or this is maybe what's going on at the moment. Um, and people or viewers should understand the current situation of the game, for example, if the team is winning or losing. Next, we want to design to teach viewers. Um, this is an example we uh, did in one of our games at Rarebyte. We, we had um, this, um, there's a difference between UI done for players versus UI for spectators. So for a player, it's maybe important to really focus on the player's character and see what's going on with the character and around the character and give a lot of feedback there. But for spectators, maybe they want an overview of all the players in multiplayer and they want to be able to compare player skills or player stats. One element which is very exciting here is um, um, one method called information asymmetry. Here, the idea is that the player and the spectator have different pieces of information. Um, very obvious one, as a streamer or as a player, I do know, for example, what strategy I'm planning at the moment. This is just in my head, so obviously this is something I as a player know, but the spectator doesn't. I as a streamer can now decide whether or not it makes my stream more interesting to tell the, play, uh, the spectators this piece of information or to keep it for myself, to keep the spectators full of tension and excitement what's happening next. So, so keep this element of surprise. As a game designer, I can also um, add elements to make this happen. For example, what we just heard to add specific UI elements or give specific overviews which are just in, um, seen by a spectator. So for example, I can see an entire map of all the different players competing to each other. And I know what's going on, but the players do not. So this is also helping me to, to get excited. Or I know as a spectator, there's a specific trap over there and the player is just running over there. And I, as a spectator, get very excited about that. So why do viewers stay or come back to a game or stream? Well, first, there's just this fierce competition that you know from sports. People like to see competition and see teams or players competing and, and basically playing against each other. And then there is drama, of course. You never know who's gonna win this game. Is it this player, is it this team, is it another one? Um, and then there is this affiliation that we want to support, um, that viewers get engaged and will support their favorite streamer, performer, um, player, or team. What we want to do is we want to design for drama. So we want to create an intense playthrough and intense matches to support that drama. Um, and if you think of esports, that's basically what is happening there is um, that um, players that are very similar in skill play against each other. So um, there's a natural drama coming from that. But if you have games that are um, played by just random players, this is different. Uh, and maybe you have to think about integrating mechanics to rebalance different player skills. There's this infamous example of rubber banding in Mario Kart, um, where you can basically, if you fall behind, you can catch up um, because you get, just get faster. We even used that uh, in a hoverboard racing game. Um, you just had to like 
move onto a trail and then you were able to catch up and there was just an intense race coming from that with completely different kind of players or skilled players. Also, we want to design to create the unexpected. So a viewer comes to stream and should never know exactly what will happen next. Um, and that's one of the reasons this viewer will probably stay to find out. Um, we can add random events or story twists to our games to change this kind of balance within the game. We can add surprise boxes, uh, crates or loot to do that. For example, uh, this here is from We Are Screwed, a game we're currently working on. Um, we have procedural content generation and um, random events in that game. Um, and it's a space co-op game um, where people take on different roles. And we use this kind of those random elements to force people to change roles all the time. Um, something which is also very interesting is how to um, make it happen that viewers can be part of the experience. So there could be, for example, a passive passive mechanic um, to make streamers, give streamers the option to involve the spectators in the, in the game. So for example, what, what I used um, in Darkest Dungeon, there's this option that you have those different characters which you can play. And I would always look at the stream and look who's most active. And then I would name the in-game characters based on my spectators or based on my viewers. So this is, they're basically getting involved in a very passive way. But I, as a um, player, I have the mechanic to involve them. Um, on the other hand, um, being, being as a, um, a spectator active, in a, in a game experience can be also very engaging. This would, be, this would mean that um, spectators can vote for specific um, things happening in the game, or now it becomes increasingly interesting to also make mechanics that you can, for example, cheer for specific players within a game, and then they get a specific boost in the game as a game mechanic or a specific item. In the end, it's about building a community around the game and making it accessible to all those viewers, all those different kind of spectator personas. The audience should feel welcome at all times, while players should still feel safe. And uh, the goal is to let viewers be a part of something. Um, next, um, we want to go uh, or quickly go through uh, some strategies we used um, on our projects. Um, so first, <coughs> So there are so many relation strategies. I mean, um, coming from a UX background, there are so many ways how you can think of evaluating the player experience. And all those can be also used basically to evaluate the spectator's experience. Those can be things like observations, think out loud tests, you are working with data, in-game data, in-game metrics, interviews, you name it. Um, but we want to introduce two specific models used in our collaboration, basically. And the first one is the indie's point of view. Yeah, let's start with the indie point of view. And of course, this is called the party test. And it looks exactly like in this picture here. Um, this works in a way, and this is very simple. Um, we would just invite 15 to 20 people to our office and do a, something co uh, called a play party. And we would just um, start a game and then have some people play this game and other people watch those people play. And then we evaluate and uh, we record that and we collect data basically. Um, and we can identify issues like with onboarding, with usability and playability. Uh, and this is both for player and spectator engagement and experience. And my point, the academics point of view, I love, again, I love working with data. And I, I do a lot of big data anal analysis, so I really try to gather a lot of, of data, either qualitative or quantitative data. Um, but what's very interesting is, for example, to build different models or in and based on the interactions of spectators with the game or with the stream, with the player or with other spectators. Um, this can be usually, um, can be data locked in the game, can be locked in the stream, can be Twitch data or can be even Twitter data, which is just related to the game. 
Um, I want to introduce you two models which, which we use, or two um, processes we often use. The first one is graph-based analysis. Here we built, based on the interaction of the spectators with each other or with the player, we built a graph. This means if as soon as two spectators would interact in a chat at a very similar time, we assume this might be some sort of communication. So we would make a connection between two nodes within this graph, which means, okay, they're connected. They have some sort of relationship in, within this graph. Um, and we can make sense out of, the, out of this data. So looking at a lot of data, this could be a graph. Um, this could how such a graph look like. And what we can see, there are some nodes with a lot of connections. Those nodes could be very relevant and important points to look at. Those can be, for example, those personas of um, commentators who want to entertain the others and are really important as an engagement starting point. So can we use this information to give those a specific reward, for example, to make sure to keep them engaged and keep them in our stream or part of our game experience? And then we can also identify the weaker points, those with not a lot of connections. And we can think of ways how to integrate those and help them to connect to other um, spectators. On the other hand, this is um, um, one of the more traditional ways to do data analysis. This is basically where you look at the number of interactions over time. So this is um, when you look at the Twitch chat, for example, you can see in minute, minute 40, there was something going on, something very important was going on. And we can find out by looking at the in-game data, uh, here was a specific boss fight, apparently also the streamer did something very well. Can we use this information to make the engagement even better for the next stream? Um, so just to summarize, we can all also say that those different evaluation strategies can actually work together. Um, again, to, so that I can do my data analysis, I need a lot of data. The point is that very, very often when we work with studios, um, it's becoming very expensive and it's becoming very complicated because the data they, the studio locked in the game just was not right, was not locked in a correct way or just not locked at all. Yeah, and the idea is here just to work together from the very beginning of the project and do a data definition together. And then we as a studio would take this definition and build it right into the uh, very foundation of the game. And we then plan and prototype our game. And when a build is ready of the game, we would start a play testing session and then we would be able to collect data that is then given back to the research institution. And since the data already fits our what we sort of need because of this definition phase, for us it's so much easier and much more cost effective to make sense out of the data and help the studio, even, it's, um, even if it's a small studio or a big studio, to help to improve the game. All right, um, a short recap of what we talked about today. Um, keep in mind, not every spectator has the same motives. There are different motives for viewing a stream or a game. Then uh, also keep in mind that you need to design for different spectator personas. And also, as we just said, seize the opportunity of co collaborations between your indie studio or your game studio and research institutions. All right, um, that's it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. Thank you so much. I think we have time for yeah. one or two questions. Towards we will be in the report area. Hi, I was wondering if uh, to combat the problem you're having um, with data sources like that being locked down by different studios, um, are there any emerging standards that are being adopted um, across the indie platforms? Um, yeah, that's a very good point, actually. So that's one of the issues we're having right now. We are actually trying to build one of such standards at the moment because, yeah, it is actually pretty easy and straightforward, but, yeah, there's exactly a lack of things like that. So thanks for pointing that out Thank also. Thank you very much. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, so have you found that uh, designing a game with this um, making it spectator um, approved uh, um, or liked 
that streamers will like quickly recognize that the game is made for that and will adopt it? Um, yeah, so the idea would be to, to build features into the game that would just enable streamers to use that to engage more with their audience, for example. Of course, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much and thank have you. a lovely evening. <laughs>